So good evening and uh, welcome to the Salsa opening keynote. Uh, my name is Osman Khan. I'm an associate professor at the Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. Though I'm missing the opportunities to meet folks in person and have those serendipitous and impromptu talks, I wanna thank everyone for their positive energy. Yeah, I worked in the, the title there. The conference has really kicked off with a wonderful first day of panels and I'm excited for the following days of talks. I also wanna thank Irina Aristarkova, our conference chair and the other organizers in putting together this year's conference, especially considering the circumstances. For those of uh, for those joining us this evening, tonight's talk is set up as a Zoom webinar. So if you have any questions for our speaker, please drop them into the Zoom Q&A box, and we will do our best to address as many of them during the conversation portion of the talk. I also want to bring your attention to the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen. Please click it to see the closed captioning for this talk. Before I welcome our keynote speaker, a brief introduction is in order. Lisa Nakamura is the founding director of the Digital Studies Institute and the Gwendolyn Calvert Baker Collegiate Professor of American Culture at the University of Michigan. She is the author of several books on race, gender, and the internet. Most recently, Race is Zoom Bombing, put out by Rutledge in 2021 and co-authored with Hannah Steverson and Kyle Lindsay. And Techno Precarious, uh, published by Goldsmiths at MIT in 2020, uh, as the Precarity Lab. She's also the lead PI for the Mellon, funded, uh, Mellon Foundation funded DISCO, uh, Digital Inquiry Speculations, Collaboration and Optimism ne Network. And more information about that can be found at um, disconetwork.org or through the hashtag Disco Network. This is a really large three-year um, Mellon funded collaborative um, multi-institutional educational grant. I first encountered Lisa's work actually in the early 2000s while at grad school and after having worked around 10 years in the then dot-com world, and probably at that time still a little guilty of being drunk on its Kool-Aid. Lisa's work was key in calling bullshit on technology's identity and neutrality and revealing that race, gender, and identity issues were very much at play and were being affected in unique ways in cyberspace. Her pioneering and continual work on these topics continues to reveal, inform, and inspire. It is my pleasure to welcome Lisa Nakamura. Thank you, Osman. It is such a privilege to have you as a colleague and to benefit from your energy as somebody who's not only been a practitioner and a scholar, but has had some firsthand experience with this world. Um, so, um, uh, I wanted to give a content warning for this talk because there is going to be some profanity and racism. Um, some of it has been bleeped out of this, but some of it hasn't. And I apologize if you've seen other parts of this talk at other venues, because now that everything is on Zoom, it means that people can go to a lot of things they couldn't go to. So there, you might have seen parts of this before, for which I apologize. So let me get started here. I was really happy to see this theme. I think it's an awesome theme. Um, the idea of energy, both as a kind of preoccupying concern in the Anthropocene, but also as a way to explain this kind of irresistible but inchoate forces which motivate things that are sometimes hard to explain in other ways, um, gave me a lot of uh, inspiration to try to put together some thinking I was doing on what is distinctive about anti-Asian racism online. It's a long, larger project I've been working on for a long time. Um, and how it is that young women of color are using some of the more vibey platforms like TikTok in particular, which has its own energy, this very new energy, um, to talk about racism, to call it out, um, and to make it uh, um, performative. Right, so I'm very interested in the work of women of color as um, people engaging in repair, digital repair, um, by both making visible the everyday racism, which is often hard to capture if you're not in a racialized body, um, and also hard to believe if you've never experienced it. 
um, and to do so in ways which I'm going to argue are an alternative to carceral forms of data capture about, say, the Asian community. So in the wake of some terrible violence against Asian and Asian American elders, um, there's been a kind of move to gather even more data from people to make the case. Um, but as we know, data is a really important pillar of the carceral state and policing isn't always the best way to deal with racism, um, especially because the police, as Grace Hong has noted in her work on this, are often so responsible for racism and racial violence. So let me start talking about um, uh, the minor energy of Asian, anti-Asian American digital racism. In 2020 to 2021, the pandemic years, it's actually 2019 to 2021, um, these years have been replete with both Asian and anti-Asian energy. Groups like Stop AAPI Hate have documented a rise in the amount of aggressive targeting of Asian people motivated by a perception that Asians are responsible for inventing and spreading the COVID-19 virus. Racism against Asians has been elevated by this movement from a minor problem. And of course, you know, racism is a minor problem if you're not the person experiencing it, um, to a major one through the energy of visual representation on digital platforms of attacks on Asian elders. And, you know, there's been a lot said about that, but I think what's not said is the role that social media and digital platforms in particular play. They are absolutely vital and viral. Um, Asian elders being pushed to the ground or struck in the face invoke strong sympathetic sentiments that mobilized the minor into the major. It warranted the perception that Asians are likely to be physically attacked as fact. Sociologist Janelle Wong, I think, um, does really important work um, putting this into some context that, you know, um, even though Asian American elders um, have faced a lot of hostility, it's still the case that the majority of attacks are on black people, that most offenders are white, even though most viral videos like the ones I was talking about have featured attacks by black men, and that most um, of the reported abuse, even from AAPI hate, is verbal abuse. It's not physical attacking. Um, and anti-black racism, you know, accounts for the vast majority of reported hate crime. So the spectacle of Asian suffering and its voyeuristic focus on telegenic violence captured on smartphone video exploits Asian elders' pain, targets Black people as a group, and distracts and misdirects viewers from the more capillary or minor types of violence captured in videos that young women um, circulate on Instagram and TikTok. And that's the majority of it. So I'm going to argue that digital ra racism, violence that happens online, has always been and is still subsumed and denigrated as minor in similar ways and for similar reasons that Kathy Park Hong calls anti-Asian racism a minor feeling. Hong herself has shifted um, during the COVID years from a minor, though highly respected and admired literary figure, to a major one, tracking along with this elevation of anti-Asian racism from a minor issue to a major issue. Um, just this earlier, I think this month, um, Kathy Park Hong was featured on the cover of Time as one of the 100 most influential people. Um, her book parsed what made the experience of Asians feeling anti-Asian racism an issue, as I said, that was a minor issue, perceived as a minor issue, but emerged as major, um, how it's distinctive how it is shared with Black experiences of, quote, having had one's reality belittled so many times she begins to doubt her own senses. And this is how she describes Claudia Rankine's work, but also how she describes Richard Pryor's work. Um, quote, this disfiguring of senses and genders, the minor feelings of paranoia, shame, irritation, and melancholy, all paradoxically and profoundly feelings that distinguish an experience from important to maybe not important. And I argue that digital racism, in fact, almost everything that happens online um, is always walking that line, right? It invokes those moments of paranoia, shame, irritation, and so on. Um, you rarely have a full out cry or break something. I guess, unless you're playing Smash Brothers. Um, but it also has been downgraded as not, maybe not important, right? Um, at least not as, as important as things that happen in real life. So as she writes, Asian American racism has a particular resonance with feelings of squeamish and ambivalent minor feelings. As she says, minor feelings, the radicalized range of emotions that are negative, dysphoric, and therefore untelegenic. 
built from the sediments of everyday racial experience and the irritant of having one's perception of reality constantly questioned or dismissed. Minor feelings arise, for instance, upon hearing a slight, knowing it's racial and being told, oh, that's all in your head. Thus, anti-Asian American racism energy as a minor energy. When violent anti-Asian racism against elders is captured and made spectacular um, and circulated on phone um, based platforms, its virality converts a minor issue into a major issue by making it um, uh, performatively and evidentially violent, right? But the technological aspects that enable the major, minor to major shift are not discussed as deeply or thoughtfully as they need to be. I think phones are now just seen as having always been there and kind of a, a transparent medium. Um, so when camera video warrants a racist act, that you might have experienced in person. For example, when I was walking with a friend here in Ann Arbor, an Asian friend, um, someone veered over to us and coughed on us and then left. But there was no way for me to capture that in my phone because I'm just not a, that quick, right? It was really fast. Um, but those feelings of ickiness and ambivalence, you know, what if she had had to cross the street and just happened to cough, right? It, it does make you think, is it in my head? Um, it was not possible to make that sensation into anything telegenic or anything evidentiary. It's just that kind of everyday racism that Asian people are all too familiar with, um, the result of capillary white supremacy that social media, um, uh, the, the kind that I'm gonna be talking about anyway, can turn into a um, conversation about racism, sovereignty, who gets to belong in what space um, by creating entertaining or viral moments that aren't uh, exploitative of people's pain, but instead are as I'm going to show you, pretty funny, um, horrifying in some cases, but also pretty funny. So in this case, the technological aspect is vital to creating this minor energy. For we got used to the idea that some kinds of racism are minor from the moment that digital media made it possible to be racist at a distance and nobody cared to do anything about it or even to call it racist, right? Um, in the 90s, when I was researching racial and gender passing and racism in chat rooms, um, the prevailing idea was this libertarian Californian ideology, which is that users should empower themselves and must empower themselves um, with the right kinds of technology, such as blocking, filters, and so on, in order to become proper digital liberal subjects. In other words, to have the right to have rights. Um, the burden was put on the user, not only to develop a thicker skin, but to adopt um, better digital hygiene, um, to hide your identity possibly to not be there in the first place, right? To read the room. Um, digital racism was always by definition minor. Platforms never penalize users for racist or um, sexist speech or behavior. And this precedent, precedent has largely led us to where we are today. Unregulated, very difficult to regulate media. So as I mentioned, the digital in and of itself has always had a minor energy in the world of media, um, still very, unrepresented in media conferences say, and the perennial debate over whether virtual experiences are real um, indexes this demotion of the digital it's still going on. So the space of negation of di disavowal is shared by the term anti-racist itself, which is a really awkward phrase because it sounds like something you try not to do as opposed to something that you can do, <laughs> um, something you're omitting or forgetting. Um, and that thing is racism, right? Just not doing it is itself an activity. Um, but I think the term anti-racist has taken, you know, a major energy this year. You see it used a lot, especially in job ads. I mean, it marks a recognition that the effort to combat racism has to be intentional, large scale and systemic. So it can't be this libertarian, you know, Californian ideology of we're all going to do better hygiene around racism and that's gonna fix it because I think we know that's not gonna work. So the young women I'm gonna talk about today um, may use TikTok and Instagram as platforms uh, to do anti-carceral data collection by recording moments of everyday racism and framing them in ways that show the immense energy that is nascent in these platforms. And this is part of a bigger project on the role of women of color in social media and gaming and how they've long contributed unpaid labor to call out misogyny by violations of user agreements and hateful behavior. And that's what my next book is gonna be about. So it's about the unacknowledged labor of the internet generally, but specifically how children, LGBTQA people, um, people of color, women and other marginalized groups 
um, have made the, the products that we use. They've assembled them in factories. So I'm just going to show you for a minute this piece um, of writing from the Bureau of Indo Indian Affairs from 1965 um, that talks about why Indians are good at making electronics. Um, this is from some research I did about Navajo women um, working in defense funded plants to make semiconductors and circuits, usually for the um, weapons and defense industry. One of the Bureau's concentrated efforts has been towards encouraging tribes to link forces with the industrial and business community. This is from United States Department of the Interior. As a result, manufacturers seeking workers with a combination of manual dexterity and highly developed sense of spatial relationships are looking towards the Indian labor market. The Indian with a natural affinity for precision work is equally at home as a high climbing steel structural worker and as a weaver of intricate designs. Somewhere between the two extremes lies electronic factory work, which calls for skill that is rooted in the pride of workmanship. So you can see this essentializing of whose body is good for what kind of labor. And even today, in the majority or a lot anyway of digital moderation work, which is something that lies between two extremes, um, you know, extreme pain and, you know, the, the entertainment and pleasure of digital video um, is seen as something that is suited to women. Um, because of their sensibility. So let me go to the next slide. This is a slide that shows a woman who was working at the, um, actually, I don't know if she worked at the plant, but I know she's Navajo and that she's weaving a rug. Um, this is an image that shows how suturing together women of color making digital products and women of color making culture has always been something that's very available to industry. Um, it's a narrative that's romantic and attractive. It makes factory work seem like something people want to do, something that's creative, something that creates something that we all um, see as modern, right? It's marrying the kind of archaic with the very, very cutting edge. Um, and it's the kind of work that can't be automated or outsourced, certainly not then. And I would say digital labor that women of color are doing, like moderation or like recording um, hate crimes and hate speech can't be moderated. Sorry, can't be automated either. So I'm going to show a video pretty soon that um, was captured by a woman named Jordan Eli Chan. And she was eating lunch, um, rather brunch, I'm sorry, with her family to celebrate her aunt's birthday. So she was with a group of people and um, she captured this video and it went viral. It got over a million views. But before I show it, I wanted to talk about a little bit why I consider this kind of work as below the waterline. Um, this unacknowledged labor is, um, first of all, defined by being defined as not labor, right? Um, it's the idea that people who are um, doing things with phones to help us understand how race and racism works, to document incidents um, in non-punitive non and non-carceral ways, at least ways that don't involve the state, um, is part of a continual history that starts from indigenous women who are making circuits and making the means of production for us to have what we have and are paid less than minimum wage, therefore not really seen as workers either, at least not workers with rights. So. Um, work below the waterline like this can be personally dangerous, emotionally exhausting, as Jordan will say, um, and maybe, you know, as I said, most importantly, by definition, not acknowledged. So I use the term to acknowledge and bring together the work that Rayvon Fouché has done, he's part of the Disco Network, to raise up the suppressed contributions of Black innovators in technology and sport. Um, Black theorist Christina Sharp's work um, in The Wake, which proposes The Wake as a space of possibility for resistant praxis after slavery. And I want to acknowledge that I write this in the wake of the Atlanta shootings um, of eight people, six of them Asian women. And I write it in the wake of the refusal to mourn this as a hate crime. Um, what can TikTok and Instagram do to help us to mourn that which is excluded from mourning, right? Um, and also Vicki Mayer's work, she's a media scholar who wrote a book called Below the Line, um, Producers and Production Studies in the New Television Economy, to acknowledge the work of all the people who are seen as non-creative, right? Script girls, craft workers, um, but, but the people who are necessary to get things done and are indeed creative. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great feminist economic work written on what happens when we exclude unpaid labor or domestic or reproductive labor. It's just a huge amount of the economy, $1.2 trillion. Um, 
And economist Nita Banks has made an excellent case why we ought to pay community organizers um, and how it is that black women are so predominantly community organizers. It's because the state failed to provide anything in the way of resources to black communities. Therefore, black communities had to do that, those things by themselves. Um, the Atlanta Neighborhood Organization Union in 1908 was founded to repair some of the damage that systemic racism produced in neighborhoods. So um, to frame this video, um, this is a video that Jordan Eli Chan made um, while eating at the Bernardus Lodge, which is a really, really nice restaurant in Napa. And it was during COVID. So outdoor space was very, very hard to come by. And there was a lot of contest over who got to use it. Oh, wait, I'm going to change the sound. Okay, it's all right. Never mind. It's right. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, say that again. Yeah, say that again. Oh, now you're shy? Say it again. Say it again. Now you're shy? What's wrong with you, man? Say it one more time. Yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, you need to leave. Yeah, you yeah. need to leave. That is not appropriate. You need to leave. Oh, you need, you to, do not talk no, you need like to leave. Like that. What's wrong you need to leave. You need to leave. Asian piece of you Oh my right god. Now. Get out of here. Yeah, I'm out. Get out. You are not allowed here. I already, I already put my you do not talk to our guests like that. Get out now. Who are these? They are value guests. Oh, are they? Yeah. 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 So um, it's a little bit muffled and I apologize. And it's also super racist, which I also apologize for. But part of what you couldn't hear was when the waitress, Jenica Cochran, who became a folk hero and also received a lot of money um, in the form of tips from people, uh, said, these are value guests. And he said, value guests in the middle of a pandemic. So the struggle over who needs to leave, um, who, uh, gets to have space, had particular resonance during COVID. Um, and especially given the history of anti-Asian and anti-race immigrant racism that happened in the US during this period too. So Jenica um, Cochran and Lofthouse shouting, you need to leave at each other, were asserting two different and related claims. First, on her part, the conditional hospitality of the host under the laws of private property in the state that she can throw somebody out because this is not the public sphere. Um, and the asin is there, you need to leave, really twins those two sounds, right? Um, and uh, he's saying you need to leave, I think because he's also really drunk, but partly because he's claiming the space for himself, that as a white man, this is where he can be and this unwanted guest, the Asian immigrant, um, cannot be here. Jenica Cochran did, in fact, get him to leave but not before he tried to invoke his own privilege and rights as a client. He said, I already put my order down here. Um, so his attack upon this family is part of a long history of understanding Asian immigrants as never really citizens, um, stemming from the government's early inclusion of Asians as ineligible for citizenship. And as Andre Brock has written before, um, the disruption of people of color's joy, solidarity, and pleasure in public. Um, so the anti-Asian hate gender engendered by these claims um, uh, you know, they were condemned. And what you couldn't see in the video was that two unnamed other customers got up to help him from getting closer to this family. Lofthouse was a tech CEO. He ran a company um, in San Francisco. So I think people were confused. You know, his, his sister-in-law is Asian as well. He's from Australia. How could someone who works in tech be so anti-Asian? Um, yet I would remind everybody that it's in places where there are the most Asians, such as California, that there's been the most anti-Asian um, activity, the most anti-Asian violence, um, and that this violence is rooted in a visceral hatred of Asians as unfair laborers 
as competition, as degraded and as polluted. So um, he was fired and there was a lot of outrage um, on the far right saying that this was cancel culture, that you know it wasn't right to, for him to be recorded and that they were accusing him of racism unfairly. But I think the great thing about you know, TikTok and Instagram videos that document this is you can't really take that seriously, you know? So I'm gonna bring you back to 1871. This is an issue of Harper's Magazine entitled The Chinese Question. And it depicts a young woman, Columbia, with a hand on a Chinese man's head, facing an angry armed group and saying, hands off, gentlemen, um, America means fair play for all men. So, you know, this is a very typical kind of image from that time. And it shows a bunch of handbills, which were also pretty common in California around then and other places. They read things like trade unions, meetings resolved to oppose the importation of Chinese barbarians into the country, must be stopped by ballot or bullet, servile laborers, the degraded labor of Asia, again, the minor, uh, minorness of Asian labor, um, the low energy or enervation of Asians. Um, Grace Hong gave a wonderful paper yesterday on how the idea of sentiment in the 19th century as that which distinguishes white people and bourgeois middle class women, particularly, um, as something as well that people of color didn't have, that Asians were insensate or you know, insensible to pain or unable to feel sentiment. Um, the lowest and vilest of the human race opposed to him on the grounds of, I'm still reading from the handbills, race, industry, politics, morality. This image was published a year after the 1870 Naturalization Act in the US, which explicitly excluded Chinese from citizenship while extending naturalized citizenship to African-Americans formerly held in slave, as slaves. Uh, in 1910, the US Supreme Court extended the 1870 Naturalization Act to other Asians, making them ineligible for citizenship. And in 1941, 100,000 people of Japanese descent, most of them citizens, were interned in concentration camps as enemy aliens. Um, the following year, California fired all Japanese Americans employed by the state government. Chan's video exemplifies the dangers of anti-racist repair labor for young women of color. Jenica Cochran, the brave waitress in this story, received over $100,000 from three GoFundMes and none of them were started by her. And I wanna also say, I'm not sure if she chose this image, but the resonance between this image and that image is just striking to me. Um, this, you know, salvific figure in a flowing gown um, defending abject Asian people was a really resonant one. Um, so she did very well. She was celebrated as a hero. She got a lot of money. Um, after her post, though, Jordan Chan received so many hate threats and hate messages and death threats, she had to make the account private and it's since disappeared, so I couldn't find it. Um, and in an interview with BuzzFeed, you know, Chan, I think, is very clear eyed about this. She thanks Cochran for defending them while critiquing the reason that they needed to be defended and also the tendency and the attractiveness of seeing white heroes or white saviors, which is part of the virality, right? Part of the appeal of this kind of Instagram document. If looking the other way in the face of public racism weren't normal, this wouldn't necessarily be heroic. Um, so this cathartic performance of anti-Asian activism by Cochrane satisfied many Instagram users desired both to see justice done and to repeat the trope of the white American woman in a flowing gown defending an impotent alien unable to defend themselves, thereby making herself more human and not making them more human. So um, Chan's act of posting this video was a form of defense that didn't fit into the trope of the silent and degraded Asian victim, yet at the same time, it made her that very thing. Um, Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, which all of these appeared on, do not protect users well from racial attacks. Um, Lofthouse stepping down as CEO fit into two narratives with a lot of traction in 2020 of August. Um, both cancel or call out, call, call out culture and an invigorated anti-racist social movement, BLM. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, the far right really tried to spin this as being cancel culture again because there was so much eagerness to see that. Um, yet I believe the way this was put together, I think very knowingly by Chan uh, makes that impossible. So this act of video documentation, distribution, and public critique was identified by the far right as an example of black activism because um, 
it turns out there had been a BLM protest that very day in Monterey with the town where this was happening, but they also did some digging and found out that Chan and her family had supported BLM. So they viewed her as an extension of that movement. Now I'm gonna show another video, which I think um, deploys a different strategy, um, not so much the iconography of white heroism and um, kind of uh, white women, particularly as these goddess-like figures, but instead one that um, uses humor to talk about citizenship, sovereignty, and conditional rights. And this one started on TikTok and then moved to other platforms. And it's called Encountered a Wild Karen Today. It was made by someone named Sarah Pashdani. That's her username. Taxes. I pay for this park, you and I don't like park. to see people wrecking it. We're, we're not. We're wrecking not wrecking it. it. There's oh literally so many berries everywhere. Oh my god, we're not wrecking it. Oh, there's so many berries out here. There's so many berries. <laughs> I cannot. Like complete twits. <laughs> we're twits. You're the one coming up to two young girls, getting young mad girls. at them for yeah, picking. Yeah, you're like <laughs> six years old. Six years old. Because we wanted to eat some berries. I'm saying, eat all the birds you want. Just don't take the bush with you. I'm it's sorry, not the bush. It's literally a. It's a tiny personally. branch. Of berries. Why don't you mind your own business? Why this don't you mind your own business? Sense. You know, that is the fucking rudest thing you've said to me. You decided go to come up to Go back where you us. came from if you wanted to use oh, like that. Oh, why don't you go back to where you came from, you fucking colonizer? Are you First Nations? No, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. You don't call me a colonizer. You're a colonizer. You're, well, you're where did you come from? Yeah, where did you come from? Where did you come from? I'm actually curious. Where the did you US. Come? US? Oh, yeah. So oh, you're not, so even you're from not here. Canadian either. Yeah, I am. Mm. Oh, so, but we are Canadian too. I was born here. I was born here too. Okay. Were you born here? No. Okay. So I, that's the last of the slides. Um, this video captures, I think, really beautifully how citizenship, sovereignty, and the conditional rights to space accorded young women of color provide an occasion for dispute and conversation about race on TikTok, a platform that's become known as an issue space. Uh, I think this went viral because of the dance, honestly. It's pretty crazy. She had a lot of energy. Um, these young women were told to go back to where you came from if you're going to talk like that. But it's really um, the attacker's inability to let it go, right? Her desire to interrupt their enjoyment of berries and belongingness um, that resulted in this impact and, in, impact and also in the conversation. And I think the way it's clipped at the end is very characteristic of TikTok rhetoric, right? This kind of mic drop. Um, they really kind of painted her into a corner there with her asserting her sovereignty as someone who's Canadian. And it turns out she's not born in Canada. Um, so in critical fabulations, um, reworking the methods and margins of design, scholar and historian Gabriella Rosner writes that design and technology, quote, become metaphors for the improvement of economic conditions. Only certain types of people, creative self-sufficient individuals molded by the design process are, design, are recognized as designers who produce value. Um, in this work, I claim that um, these young women of color are producing value by framing Asian racism, anti-Asian racism um, in a very designerly way, in a very creative way, um, yet their labor is still degraded just as labor from the 1870s, the 1960s, and so on have been degraded. Um, and they are the most targeted on the social platforms, the most harassed, the most likely to be stalked, the most likely to be threatened. Um, and their work needs to be acknowledged by platforms in order for platforms to improve. Um, this work is an act of care, relational act of care that keeps things usable. It captures and documents this behavior using digital tools and creates accountability. So even when these women aren't obviously going in and flagging objectionable content, um, indeed, their content is often flagged as objectionable because it's about race. Um, the, the act of making it, the act of distributing it, the fact it is here, that people are liking it and maybe not liking it, um, makes it visible, right? It creates a, an archive. Um, and despite social media platforms often banning women from doing this kind of work because they take things down much more often when it's women of color making it, whether or not there's any racism in it, <laughs> Um, even the mention of the word race can provoke a takedown. Um, this labor is really valuable because it can't be out automated and it can't be outsourced, right? It creates a climate, um, it creates an energy, 
It fills in a gap where platform moderation itself completely fails. Um, banning people we know doesn't work very well. People just wait and come back. They in fact celebrate being banned. Um, suspensions, um, you know, uh, there have been all kinds of ways to try to get people to act better on platforms, and, and we know they don't work because platforms are just as bad as they ever were. Um, racial aggression is complex, contextual. In this case, go back to where you came from, would not be flagged or reportable as a slur, and nor would fucking Asian. Um, the word fucking would be, but the word Asian and the word fucking Asian together wouldn't be. Um, being told that Trump is going to fuck you, which is what the Lofthouse guy said, um, isn't something that can be um, reported. It can't be filtered for, it can't be automated. It, no one would recognize it. I, I've reported lots of these things on Twitter. They never get taken down. So how can we bring our analytical skills and methods to bear on envisioning a different internet, a different techno-social so, different techno-social arrangement for ourselves, while at the same time acknowledging the work that young women of color do under this waterline and the work that we're all doing under the waterline? right by doing the kind of research that we do sometimes or teaching the ways that we do the work that our students are doing by participating in these conversations um, by bringing these things into class to talk about them with us say by writing about them where they deploy their courage art wit and skill to document this kind of um, energy right how can our tools convert a simplistic reading that identifies with the perpetrator's frame of reference as a possible victim as someone who's been canceled or exposed and contextualize it instead um, as capturing this capillary white supremacy that can be brought into the light and made viral by artful means. So um, these videos go beyond content creation. Um, they, uh, they exemplify how um, young women of color engage in the labor of digital social repair as optimistic, as performative, as intimate and relational. So this is not big data at all. It's not useful as big data, um, which is where it's power lies. Um, instead, uh, it's part of labor that happens on all parts of the spectrum and needs to be acknowledged in that way. So this is part of work on the racial and gendered solidarities and intimacies that happen on visual digital social platforms. Um, when we see them, we can hear the voices, imagine ourselves at a family gathering. They can bring us into a park. Um, we can imagine being with an older relative, which gives them all the more impact. One way to be in solidarity is to listen to the voices of those who were harmed, rather than to punish those who, were, who perpetrated the harm, at least, you know, punish them in ways that the state would punish them. Um, in a 2019 study by Sarita Schoenbeck, um, Oliver Hameson, and me, um, survey research found that targets of online abuse weren't asked about reparative approaches to content moderation. In other words, how could they be helped as people who had been victims of abuse rather than how could you punish other people who had done the abuse? Um, some forms of remediation were seen as, as desirable, like education helping somebody understand what was wrong with that, um, making the, you know, the abuse or the crime visible, but not necessarily banning anybody, um, asking for an apology, asking for somebody to pay a small amount of money. <laughs> like there was a wide range of different ways that reparation could be made. How can we make um, kind of in an optimistic sense, people who have been attacked feel better instead of try to make perpetrators feel worse? So I welcome any conversation or comments that you might have and appreciate your time um, during this Zoom moment. And um, thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. That was really wonderful and insightful. Uh, I'll just remind all our uh, the audience to, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, as we all probably know from Zoom, it's down below. But Lisa, I thought I, I, I might start it off um, uh, with just a kind of question, which is sort of uh, what pushes something something to the what you were calling major energy versus minor. So I'm thinking about the Chan video, where the video itself, like you said, you know, I remember seeing that. Um, you know, is it is it because it points to the real and the real threat of violence that we it, it caught virality versus the other violence that was perpetuated on her afterwards, right? You said there was so mm -hmm. much so many threats of um, that in a way we never knew about, we never learned and why, and that's probably where more violence is happening on that mm -hmm. kind of online platform, but for some reason doesn't pick up the virality and as, a, as such stays as, as a minor, in your terms, minor energy. 
So I'm just mm-hmm. curious on, on the two, you know, is it just because we like the sensationalism of a video and, and, or that it points to kind of a true violence, of a physicalness, mm-hmm. a corporealness versus where, I, where actually true violence might be happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a great question. It's kind of a methodological question for people studying um, digital culture. You know, I think because our field started out, and I'm definitely part of this, um, as a field that studied the visual, right? I think that was what humanists could do in a way. Um, And all the while, there's great work happening on infrastructure, people like Matt Kirschenbaum and Lev Antmanovich and so on. But people who started out in English, like I did, could look at iconography and images and draw things from there. So it it disincentivizes you in a way to think about the, not just the mode of production, you know, the the act of the phone itself kind of being hard to use in moments of really quick racism and how people are optimizing that, Um, but also the consequences of production. You know, the kind of harassment and banning, um, which lead to the exact opposite happening of what you would want to happen. So this family is attacked. This girl in particular is attacked and um, bravely records it. And the woman who defends her gets $100,000. And the, the girl who makes the video is shunned and kind of forced off of the Internet, where presumably she had her own friends and her own life worlds to tend to and was kind of had had to be ejected from those. So I think, you know, the before and the after of the digital, right, the means of production, who's making these things, how are they being made, but also what's the price of making them is something we need to look at more carefully. Great. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to start taking questions. So we have our first question um, uh, from an anonymous attendee. Can you say a few more words about what it is to, rep- what is repair here? And whether the platform itself that makes this solidarity possible, is it about distributing racial abuse, spreading it around more so that, so that it's not just so targeted and individualized to one community or, mm-hmm. or on one community? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I want to invite you, Osman, to answer any of these questions as well, because I mean they're they're broad questions, right? I think they apply in a, across a range of disciplines and kinds of examples. Um, I think that question of uh, is just spreading racism around good? Obviously not. You know, I think it's really bad um, because you know, again, that question of what's below the waterline, what's before and after, you know, what are the conditions of making those always hover, right? You know, there's often a price to be paid. So not just doing it is not a good idea. Um, And I think as many people have said about BLM videos of, you know, police brutality, these are very traumatic and they're triggering and and putting them out there with no context or even putting them out there with context is not something you should do lightly. It's something that, you know, Darnella Frazier won a Pulitzer Prize for because it was incredibly hard to make that, she deserved that, right? Like that was obviously an act of great personal sacrifice to do it. Um, So I think social media in particular has a lot of tools. Um, TikTok has, you know, ways to respond to people like side-by-side screens, which I think people have used to great effect to frame things and saying putting racism out there isn't just enough, like having people comment or, you know, speak from their perspective as Indian or as Black or whatever is important. Um, But I think as well, you know, Jordan used the Instagram video to make an appeal for people to vote. So I don't think there there is such a thing as just putting it out there, right? I think people are very smart, especially young women of color, and they use these viral moments to mobilize energy around other things. So she was doing this right before the election. And she said, if you're watching this, you can do something. You know, you can go out and vote. People chose to give money (laughs) instead to the waitress because that's how American neoliberalism chooses to give love, right? Money is love. Um, But I think she was saying, you know, political action is love. And that's what she wanted that video to do. So um, certainly getting evidence of racial violence helps people who don't believe it's real, right? I think it does help them to understand, but it's almost never just putting it out there, right? So I think, you know, we could have a whole other conversation about what these platforms are doing that make it hard. 
Um, but I, there are a lot of things that are making it um, natural. So I think that, why do these girls have their phones out so fast? You know, I think it is a natural reaction now to um, know that this is part of life. It's not just the virtual, it's part of life. And if you put it out there on social media, it actually may take a minor feeling, which is being harassed by, you know, this white woman it happens all the time to people of color, all the time. Um, and elevated to something kind of major, right? So you can see for yourself what that looks like and possibly what it feels like. Great, thanks. We'll take uh, the next question by uh, Philia Christoph, um, who's, who says, thanks so much for a great talk. Uh, do you consider optimism itself to be a form of below the waterline labor? Oh my gosh, what do you think? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Such a good question. I mean, you know, optimism has to have an object. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to have ambient optimism. That would be nice, but I think usually it has an object. So, you know, um, optimism about what? So, you know, optimism that we can improve technological systems to better acknowledge people who are making them and, you know, do our best to try to understand them on their own terms with some technological kind of thinking. Um, I'm optimistic about that as something I can do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I was not being quite serious when I said that our academic labor is below the waterline, because it absolutely isn't. We're getting paid. You know, I, I think I'm using that term more for people who are not just not getting paid, but who are actively exposing themselves to danger um, and maybe even harming their future employment possibilities. So I think it's that kind of labor, which is so hard to think of as labor and certainly being publicly optimistic about racial harmony can certainly be a form of labor. You know, you could say that's kind of what community organizers, religious or spiritual leaders do sometimes. Um, but I think that's, that's a really good example of kind of capillary effects, you know, that people do it in individual moments. They do it in comment sections. They do it in conversations on the subway right? They'll, they'll do it in these little places, um, which, you know, I take the capillary term from Foucault when he's talking about the dis difference between discipline and control. <laughs> and I like it so much um, because he's using it to say, you know, it becomes not just internalized, but pervasive so that it no longer is even visible as control, right? It becomes internal and external and, you know, everywhere at once. So I think optimism can be that. I would like to hear more what people think about that. Like, how would we do that? I think we're all over pessimism. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm just waiting for another question, but uh, while we wait, maybe uh, I'm with you. I think uh, it's a different age. Age of irony, pessimism seems to be uh, maybe if not an end, needed to be at an end in order to, to find ways forward. Um, it's strange. I think people associated pessimism with post-structuralism for mm -hmm. a while yeah. or like political innervation, but I don't see that as the case. Hmm. I mean, not to go off on a whole thing about theory and why we need it and why theory can be optimistic and so on, but, you know, I think you know, Lauren Berlant, who we sadly lost, was really wonderful at writing about, you know, how optimism can be both cruel, but also so necessary. Speaking of, of innervation, it's, it is late in the day. So, yeah, and then we all know the Zoom fatigue comes yes. comes out a lot faster. True. Um, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll still give people a few minutes. Um, okay. Also, I know people are absorbing the talk in, so it's taking its time. Um, Do you, you know you you also had brought up performativity um, and sort of um, this quickness with the camera now? I'm curious on just kind of that in um, both working for it, but then also performing for it in a way. Mm. Uh, you know, it's working like you said to 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 reveal things, but then also are we all? Um, I don't want to use the word exaggerating, but but in a way, a good example was what you said. Was that gesture truly racist or not? And then, of course, a certain framing. Uh, I'm even going back to the Rodney King, where the defense and prosecution both use the same film, just one person uh -huh. wrote it down to yeah. show that it like how. So a certain framing, and this is go, going back to kind of this, the the frame itself. So it can elicit a certain response. So, so I'm kind of curious. Um... That is a, a great question. I mean, I think we spent the pandemic watching, you know, the formation of a new genre, which is Karen videos. You know, for a while I was getting calls from the press about, what do you think of Karen videos? Or what do you think of Karen's? And it was this viral thing and it kind of went away, um, but it was driven by people being captured in some cases, um, I think many of these people were just completely mentally ill and it was super unfair. Um, but in other cases, performing, as you say, right? A adopting this identity of very public racism and performing it with the hopes that it would be captured um, and have something happen to it so that maybe people could fight about whether, oh, these, these you know, people picnicking in the park are so wrong and we should arrest them and this woman was right. Um, and, you know, once something enters social media as a first person, first question was saying, you know, the platform has its own logics around who's going to see it, you know, who gets to comment on it, whose comments are going to be seen, you know, other verified users comments always float to the top. So you get to see what people who are already influencers think about any influential <laughs> video. Um, uh, so I think that's right. And, and that raises a question like, what's the value of being captured as a performatively racist person? Well, I know that one couple, uh, right, they ran for, or they're running for some political position now. Oh, right, right. And they were at the Republican convention, That's but they right, right. kind of got arrested, didn't they? Yeah, but again, to your point, it worked in their favor, right? right? Like, who's did. favor did it, you know, it works, works too. Uh, so we have a question from Mark, uh, from uh, Mark Pizzato. Uh, please comment on how the video with the elderly white lady was also about age difference. If she were Asian, but the same age, how might the dynamics be different? Would disrespect or respect be perceived in a different way? Have you seen conflicts like that with people of similar ethnicity but different ages on digital platforms? Well, that's the Karen trope, is that there are Zoomers who are cool and young and know what's going on, and then there's a middle-aged lady, white lady, who just doesn't, right? And they can be very cruel. I don't think you could have an older Asian woman and these two younger women um, have a conversation where the older Asian women said, go back where you came from. You know, it just wouldn't make any sense because they would just say that back to her or it, it wouldn't work, right? Like it, it really is leveraging subtler privilege in that moment. And in Canada, like they are super aware of like their subtler status and First Nations. And she asked right away, like, are you First Nations? And she asked that because she knows they're not. You know, she's trying to say, you don't have the right to call me out as a racist, even though what I just said was super racist because the only person who can do that to me is an indigenous person. Um, and then we started talking about birthright citizenship and who was born in Canada, and it turns out it is them and not her. So I don't think you could have that particular set of problematics if it was another older Asian woman. 
Um, but you could probably have some big brouhaha that would be telegenic in a different way. Yeah. I'm curious also, um, you know, between sort of minority groups, you had brought up BLM, but also um, post COVID kind of the mm. race that rose about Asian. Um, and then also kind of, I'm thinking um, during the LA riots, how minorities were put against each other. Um, so in this sort of current, current condition, what's the sort of allyship that you're seeing Rise, rising up or or still not rising up right on one level maybe there is or maybe there's a generational or and like I said I, I think there's this front facing and there's still something that as you said is is minor energy but there's mm -hmm. a lot going on there that maybe doesn't get the virality mm -hmm. there is between the kind of the groups is there absolutely stronger allyship or there is inherent? And then we probably have to talk about it in America. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Once we go global, we mm -hmm. know certain racial things oh, that yes. absolutely, absolutely come up again. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the kind of allyship that people think about when they think of cross-racial allyship is Jenica Cochran. Because they see her as acting again her against her own best interests as a white woman in a white mm -hmm. supremacist mm -hmm. society. When you see black people defending Asian people or Asian people defending black people, that doesn't get viral, mm -hmm. even though it happens all the time, mm -hmm. because it's not seen as an act of sacrifice in the same way a white woman is sacrificing her own privilege to confront a white man. So, um, so I think that's that's what comes first to my mind when I think about that question. Um, but I think as well, you know, COVID is both exceptional and non-exceptional. I mean, there's been cross-racial coalitional organizing against racism for a long time. You know, it, it's not just started. It, it's just that it's not trending. <laughs> so I think, you know, Stop AAPI Hate was something I wanted to talk about because it, it trended, you know? And so I feel like this is a moment for Asian American and Asian theory to kind of have a say because people are kind of interested in it now. And there has been a wave of, you know, more trainings, more hiring, more awareness. I mean, we're in this academic bubble, so we kind of see it from our point of view. Um, but there is a little more cultural purchase now for Asians and Asian Americans to assert that racism does exist for us. Um, and it's both good and bad that the reasons have to do with these videos of, of poor old people being, you know, hit in the face. You know, it, it really ought to be around what Rachel Koo and Matt Bowie, who is my colleague here, call slow violence, the, the slow violence of institutional racism, which has been continuing to invisibly and visibly produce inequality. But that's hard to make into a viral moment. All right, we have some more questions coming up. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, do you think that any of the characteristics of TikTok such as the ability to add text easily, help women of color shape the narrative surrounding the videos they post? Or does the virality public consumption of the video lessen that agency? What a good question. I mean, the, the TikTok video I showed was called Caught a Wild Karen Today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it does endow the person making the video with the ability to give it a name which I think is valuable because, you know, video media um, does tend to be more open to interpretation unless you're able to frame it in some way, you know, with some, in some form. So even if you frame it by posting it and then putting a description in the, um, the description field, that's not what people see when they click the video. A lot of times those are concealed by default. You only see them when you click on them, like with YouTube, right? So they put this right, this Karen thing, right on the front of the video so you knew what you were seeing and you were prepared to view it a certain way as you were saying like you know a lot of violent you know racialized violence videos even when they're extreme can be framed to mean different kinds of things so i think that's right and instagram allows that as well so um i haven't even talked about like the amazing kinds of editing that you see on TikTok that really help you understand um what that feeling of racism is, right? Because racism is, it's a 
it's an act of violence, but the reason it's viral is that it's also a feeling and it's a feeling people have experienced themselves lots of times and they want to see it acknowledged, but it's also a feeling many people have never experienced from the perspective of someone receiving it. And they're now, I think, more curious about it than they were before, um, before our kind of moment of racial reckoning that happened last two years ago. Um, so another question came up from the audience. Uh, why do you think it's taken STS and digital studies so long to acknowledge existence of issues of hate and racism in technology? Well, I'm trying to answer this without actually <laughs> harshing on anyone in particular or anything in particular. Um, you know, I think that STS is uh, a very historical field and digital objects weren't didn't you know weren't seen as historical in the same way even 20 years ago right they were kind of history of the present kind of things um but i think as well a lot of fields aren't good at talking about race and racism you know ethnic studies is a field that can do that and that's why it's that thing so i think it's not unique to those fields i think it's kind of a broad problem um, but I agree with the question's premise that it is it is the case that it's taken a long time and and part of it is pessimism, you know, fields that can be very pessimistic about their ability to intervene in something and do a good job and the digital moves quickly I think people don't always feel they can do a good job. I think we should just forget about doing a good job honestly and just do what we can do. Um, but yes, I agree. That's the case. <laughs> let alone feels like engineering. Right. Well, that's the other way is to be very positivistic and just describe things. And, you know, racism is an actual thing and can be described, but not using the methods that people are using. Right. Uh, we have a question from Derek Woods. Uh, thanks for a great talk and for joining us at uh, Salsa. I'm thinking about platforms and their political economy and always wondering what counts as a platform in a time when that term is really expanding, just like media theory uh, conversations about them. When you think about digital racism and reparative labor, how do you distinguish among platforms? Are you seeing groupings or distinctions or platformness operating outside of platforms? Ah, oh, that's another great question. I think the term platform has become very metaphorical and it's used pretty promiscuously so I often hear it in startling ways <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if what people mean by it. So, I mean, to me, uh, you know, Nick Srinicek's book on platform capitalism, you know, gives a really good definition, um, which is that a platform is an organization or a structure which owns data, right? It, it's a structure for capturing data and for making data valuable. So it could be making data valuable in the form of selling it to other people or using it for your own ends or archiving it so that you can later sell it back to people or sell it to other people. Um, but it's really a, a kind of capitalist formation around ownership of data. So anything we call a platform could be anything which captures that value and records, you know, saves it, resells it, reorganizes it to refunnel the value away from the person who made it to the person who now has it. So I won't even use the word own, right? I'm just going to use the word has. <laughs> That's what the platform is. It's the having formation. Um, so that's how I would define it. Um, I think the reason it's become so popular as a metaphor is that that kind of extraction of data, especially personal data, is happening all over the place. And it's become newly visible to people because of the way platforms do it so blatantly, right? Like when you see the shoes you were going to buy but didn't buy on a different place, a different app, you realize, oh, right, like this isn't about me. It's about these shoes. It's about the desire to sell these commodities to me by selling my own preferences and my own data back to me. So um, that's not just a digital activity anymore, or if it is, it's it's happening everywhere and not just on the phone. Right. 
Someone asked, uh, you spoke at the beginning of your talk about Kathy Park Hong, feeling that her experience was so often discounted that she doubted the reality of her experience and about racism in digital spaces seeming minor or not real because it happens at a distance. Can you speak more about how these female AAPI's activists are working to change this dynamic and in fact, using digital tools to convey the reality of racism? Oh, that's such a great, that, that's so beautifully written. I just want to steal that whole thing. Um, yeah, I think that um, something I didn't have time to talk about in the video is the, is the role of reaction in videos. I mean, there's a whole genre of reaction videos. So, you know, two, two really cool young dudes, you know, who look like hip hop fans listening to Phil Collins in the air tonight, right? That's, that's, like chef's kiss like that's the reaction video like you want to see how something that you know and are really tired of is received by someone who's never heard it before and of course they think it's awesome because it is kind of awesome just not right now <laughs> or not to me so um the video of loft house shouting you know fucking asians and everyone going you know whoa and like being so appalled is really important that you know how to take it that you know she says that's racist like that it, it just tells you so you can see both that it's landed and how it's landed like what the feeling is of of receiving racism but also the resistance you know when i've been ching chonged in public i often slink away in fact i think i've always slunk away because i can never think of what to say and that's what the minor feeling is right when you you can't bring the words into being because there aren't any words for that, right? So they produce words. And I think in the second video, the reaction of laughing is really important, right? That brings agency back into those girls' hands. So they're being shamed and, you know, said being told to, that they're alien by this woman. And they just start laughing. And one says, I cannot even. So like, I cannot even. What, that's right. Like, it doesn't even need to have an object. Of course you can't even because it's it's terrible, right? It's a moment that got captured and framed as an impossible, I can't even, um, which is also the kind of minor feeling of that kind of racism, you know, where there's no clear way to intervene or to spring into action. So what you do is you make a TikTok and that's what they did. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, uh, more, a kind of more personal question uh, uh, or statement. I just want to say thank you for doing this work. Is this a new book project? Yes, <laughs> it is. And, you know, it was inspired very much by my own COVID social media use and seeing what people were doing. Um, and trying to find some kind of optimism, like where is change gonna happen on platforms or in the digital culture? You know, I've spent 20 years saying how awful, <laughs> not how awful, but like, you know, how endemic racism is to every aspect of digital culture, right? The parts we can see and the parts we can't see, but there's also continual acts of repair and maintenance going on, which is why it still exists or why people still see value in it or why they're still there. So I was gonna to try to look with a kind of different lens and, um, you know, in the spirit of trying to steal innovation from below, which is a term that's very problematic, but like, you know, actually looking seriously at how people are solving their own problems, trying to see how um, this generation of social media users, um, as well as earlier generations are addressing the problem of racism using the tools that they have. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, neurodivergent Karens feel particularly vexing, like the Victoria's Secret Karen clearly experienced intense anxiety over being filmed. On the one hand, uh, I want to hold empathy for her fears, a la uh, Lamar Bruce's notion, radical compassion. But on the other hand, this anxiety only led to an escalation of her violent behavior. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure. Remember I, I, the Victoria's Secret, Karen? Do you? I, do, I unfortunately I do not. Maybe the. Uh, it would be it would be helpful to know more about what happened in Victoria's Secret. Yeah. But I'm I'm sure Victoria's Secret is a place where a lot of that thing that kind of stuff happens. 
Um, but I, I get the gist of the question, mm -hmm. right? Which is that you see the genuine suffering on the part of Karens who don't want to perform and are absolutely terrified of being canceled. So um, there's one I keep in an archive but haven't used yet of a woman who's wearing a mask and she's cowering trying to hide her own license plate because someone is making a video of her because they got into a fight and she used some kind of slur and they followed her home and were harassing her. So she was crouching in front of her license plate crying. And it was indeed the saddest thing you ever saw. And the person pursuing her was a man. You could see she was completely terrified. Oh, there's a link. Um, so, um, yeah. So should we hold space for the sometimes justified anxiety and fear that people feel when they've been caught being racist? Well, yes, of course, right? Everybody deserves compassion. That's kind of a given. I think um, everybody, the only part of this I can probably do a good job of answering at all has to do with how I think platforms can produce more channels for this to happen in, right? <laughs> so, you know, comment sections are horrible because they're completely uncurated. I think Reddit does a better job in some ways with curation, because at least they have moderators who know the culture of their own subreddits and are able to create different rules for each subreddit. That, so there's a little bit of governance going on. Um, you know, of course, understanding people's context and their points of view when these things happen is good. Um, so, that's a that's a great question because it is so hard to know the answer to it, but I feel like there are solutions or forms of address anyway that are happening every day that be interesting to study them more. I'm kind of curious about that sort of the sort of counter surveillance. I'm not going to call it a state, but um, of the sort of public shaming, but the sort of counter to let's say state controlled or kind of uh, majority controlled and uh, what, what its repercussions actually will be. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I'm completely fascinated by this question. I mean, one of the reasons I was thinking about this anti-carceral data collection is that the police are not involved in any way in these events. Like no one gets called, no one gets arrested, no one even gets in trouble with the police. Instead, it gets handled in a different kind of way. And sometimes people are more afraid of this and they are being arrested. So I think that maybe Victoria Secret Karen is a good example of that, that at least getting arrested is semi-private, you know? Um, but we kind of know that you have to do really major racism to get arrested. And even then, often you yourself will get arrested, you know, as the victim. So um, I'm very interested in other ways of collecting data which can produce accountability that don't involve the police um, and also kind of help out the problems we have around automating, you know, detecting toxicity because none of these things would ever get flagged as being racist, you know, so they're, they're kind of non-prosecutable, non-prosecutable, they're unaccountable, yet they happen all the time. And so it's so frustrating as Kathy Park Hong says, you know, you're kind of surrounded by these things. And yet there's this feeling that you can't do anything because they never rise to that level where everybody has to do something. Um, I think just another question coming up. Uh, it's about repair to those who've been harmed rather than revenge or cancel culture of those who feel always already belonging. How, oh, uh, how I understand the talk. I just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's, that's where I'm kind of going with this. <laughs> you know, uh, if you kind of follow this notion that regulation both by the state and by platforms is not working, right? Isn't the way to go. So just on a pragmatic level, nothing gets 
taken down like this. And, you know, it just doesn't work well. And in addition, it really is painful for women of color who have to moderate this stuff, like look at beheadings and look at people shouting racial slurs all day. Like, it's just a really good example of how the global north funnels all of its shit to the global south right, that they have to look at that and we, so that we don't have to look at it or they look at it and we look at it. Um, I think the reparative model, which is what Sarita and um, her team are looking at, is a lot more interesting. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's gonna work better. Well, I will say it's gonna work better because the other thing isn't working at all. Um, but the fact that it's never been thought of is really interesting. Right, I think that the digital has become a kind of carceral punitive surveillance mode, but what if it became a more restorative mode? Is that possible? Is it worth trying? I mean, I think it is worth trying, absolutely. There's no structural or technological reason why we couldn't do that. Like if we can, you know, do micro payments and Bitcoin and all that, we can surely funnel $5 from someone who was ching chonged if they would make them feel better, right? Like buy a cup of coffee or whatever. It's doable. I think the question is whether it's culturally kind of possible. And kind of to that point, uh, uh, someone just posted a comment um, regarding your comment that Reddit does better. The subreddit moderators aren't employees at Reddit. So this is happening by unpaid labor. Absolutely, I should have said that. Definitely, um, Wikipedia, like so many of the things that are actually kind of working okay are unpaid labor. And that is not a coincidence, right? When you pay people to do the kind of labor that people are being paid to do now for platforms, it's horrible. It's exploitative, it's damaging. And in some ways, you know, it's that idea of the labor of love mm -hmm. that if you have personal engagement, if you have care, if you're trying to repair something, you will do it for free and you'll do a good job. It's if you're being immiserated or exploited or otherwise taken advantage of, it sucks all of the care out of something which is fundamentally a caring activity. So you could say like packaging jelly beans to send to people on Amazon in a factory is an act of care, but it's an un, it's a kind of, ex, you know, it, it's extracted unwillingly from the person who's doing it, which makes it a very different act, I think. Um. Next question regarding uh, VS Karen. White autistic folks tended to only take the Karen's point of view. Autistic people of color tended to agree that being recorded is stressful, uh, but also emphasized that the Karen's target was a Nigerian immigrant and needed to film herself as a mode of self-preservation. Fidgets and fries had a particular nuanced take. There's the Victoria's Secret Karen. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about Karen, right? It's a really, really big net that catches up a lot of people who probably oughtn't to be there. <laughs> so people who are behaving in non-typical ways or are having trouble, you know, presenting in a acceptable way, whether I consider it, you know, like, in other words, people who are caught out and then framed as being racist when maybe they're just in some other space, um, they don't belong in those moments at all. And it's not fair. Um, I think this question speaks to the kind of side taking that Karen videos engender. I mean, that's what Karen videos are trying to do, right? They're trying to separate those who um, are racist from those who aren't racist. And that was in and of itself is already a kind of act of representational violence, right? Um, I think racism is as Park Hong says a, a kind of affective state as well as a legal category, I mean, kind of a toothless legal category um, or a category about who is a good and who is a bad person. So I've seen that language used a lot like, oh, it's true. I, you know, ran into this Chinese person and called him Kung Flu, but I'm still a good person. You know, there's, there's this dissonance around what kind of a person a person is and how that then wipes away something that they did that in fact was racist. So um, that's a whole other essay around that question of personhood and how race um, relates to it, right? That, you know, you can't take my personhood away by saying I'm racist because I'm not 
I'm not that kind of person. But racism is itself the act of taking away someone else's personhood. So there does seem to be a real struggle over who can occupy the category of person. It can't be both people at the same time. Someone just put a statement. Uh, racism is a form of energy that energizes racists. Wow. <laughs> that should have been the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, one, one you know, way to kind of come back with it is like, is anti-racism a form of energy which can animate anti-racism? <laughs> anti-racists, you know? And I, I really ask that because I'm a little troubled by how weak the kind of trope or the rhetorical value of a term like anti-racist can actually be, you know, because it needs racism to exist in order to mean anything, first of all, which makes it of limited use down the road. It kind of, you can anticipate people wanting racism to continue so they can have anti-racism. Um, but it's also like the term pro-choice and anti-choice, mm. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it, it sets up a state that's already very, very uneven. Um, so, um, wait, I don't know if that's the example I was thinking of. Anyway, I think people who are, are you know, generally against oppression often find themselves kind of stuck in these undesirable rhetorical corners where there is no word to describe not wanting to be something which is demonstrably destructive and bad, right? That thing itself has a name. But the thing which is against that thing doesn't have a name. So I think one of the kind of jobs of um, social movements now is to figure out how to position themselves in, in ways that are powerful. So I think obviously BLM did that. Um, it's a multiracial coalition. It's still mostly associated with Black people, but you know it's always been open um, to other races. And they don't call themselves anti-racist. <laughs> they just call themselves BLM. So I think you know, claiming an identity, which is more about who you are and less about what they are, it may be a more powerful position. So we're, we're coming at time. Um, so if there's any more questions, please post them. Um, Otherwise, maybe Lisa, is there any sort of closing remarks that you're thinking about or as a question came in that sort of sparked some thoughts that you may want to end with? Oh, well, I forgot to thank Irina Aristarkova and all the people who put the conference together during some really difficult times. I really appreciate the, the work that that's also one, you know, it's also very invisible labor. Um, and I also really miss the dance party, which Salsa is famous for. I don't think you can... Is there going to be a Zoom dance party? Does anybody know? Well, I went to Salsa as a grad student and saw all of my much admired heroes dancing. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is, a I can't believe this is happening. It's so, so crazy and so great. I was too embarrassed to dance myself. Well, hopefully you were able to note who was a good dancer or a bad one. Oh, of course, absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Irene, I just posted there's the Sensorium performance at 7 p.m. tonight. Awesome. OK, well, great tradition. I'm glad that Salsa is continuing yeah. the, the joy at the end of the evening. So we'll, do have, we'll have a teledance, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, if there's no uh, questions, and I know we are getting close to the end. Um, Derek Woods, thanks everyone again. Uh, but I want to thank you, Lisa, really for giving such an insightful talk and you know really having a wonderful conversation. And to everyone out there, thank you for all your questions that generated such a stimulating conversation. Uh, for those of uh, you who joined us online, thank you and thank you for your questions. These videos are recorded and will be uploaded. Um, so please check them out if you couldn't join for the duration of the event. Um, Wishing you all safety and health. Again, Lisa, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, really, good night. Thank you.